I am from the University of West Georgia. I was introduced to Stephen through a uh, mutual friend of ours, Robert Moore, who was actually a big inspiration for me getting involved in astronomy. And um, I've been very lucky with my uh, science career in um, being just sort of getting into all of this various stuff quite haphazardly, actually. And um, Stephen has brought me here. Um, I know that he has put some per of his personal money into bringing me here because he feels it's important to uh, try and explain some of the science behind what's going on when you guys are looking at telescopes, when you're using various filters, that sort of thing. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of an introduction to spectroscopy. Um, for those of you who are interested, um, it, my, my introduction to spectroscopy came in that uh, when I was a master's student, I did a uh, little bit of work with the El Hiras 3. And when Stephen purchased one for the Charlie Bates Solar Astronomy Project and found out I lived just down the road and had some working knowledge with it, he, uh, he ended up bringing me in um, to help him out with some of that kind of stuff. And so here I am. And, you know, I'm, I'm having a blast with it. I've had great interactions with many of you out in the audience already. So... But we're going to go ahead and get started with uh, what is spectroscopy? So spectroscopy is the study of light, specifically the study of visible light um, as we're going to be looking at it. And I'll get to the, why that is in just a second. But as you can see from this, this is the various spectra of all of the different elements in the periodic table of elements. And as you can see, split out into its component colors, there's a bunch of different lines up there. I like to tell people that you can think about the spectra as a barcode that gives you very specific information about each of the individual elements. Every element, every molecule, every complex hydrocarbon chain that you can think of has its own unique individual barcode. If you know what you're looking at, able to let you decipher the light emitting material in the universe and make inferences about dark material in the universe, like dark matter, right? And things like black holes. So all of this is coming out of this study of spectroscopy. You can see here, this is a little bit more um, in-depth look at just some very specific elements. No two elements are going to have that same barcode. No two molecules are going to have the same barcode. The electromagnetic wave spectrum obviously goes from radio, microwave, infrared, all the way through X-ray, gamma radiation, all of that. Spectroscopists do deal with things in the microwave, in the infrared, in the ultraviolet. There are lines that are emitted, but, you know, especially for people who are just getting involved in the hobby, just getting involved in what is spectroscopy, the visible light is really what's best. Why? Well, that's what we see. Why not deal with that, right? And there's a ton of information that's available if you understand what you're looking at. So a lot of people are probably familiar with the Roy G. Biv uh, mnemonic for remembering the colors from wavelength, longest wavelength to shortest wavelength. And that's because that's the way that the light breaks up as it comes through a prism or a diffraction grating. So there's actually a reason behind that. You may have learned it in art, the, the red, orange, yellow on through, right? It has to do with the way that light is broken up as it comes through the prism. The reason why we're mostly interested in visible light has a lot, you can see here, there's a very nice window right in the Earth's atmosphere at the visible wavelength range. And that allows us to see what we coin visible light, right? You've got a little bit on the UV end of the spectrum, you've got a little bit back to the infrared end of the spectrum, but then we have things like water vapor that really take a lot of that light that is coming towards us out before it gets down to the surface of the Earth. So unless we wanted to evolve to have eyes the size of the very large telescope array radio dishes, we're sort of stuck with this very narrow wave band, just a few nanometers across, right? Incredibly small chunk of this overarching electromagnetic spectrum. What is a spectra actually? Well, it, you are looking at the visible wavelength ranges, right? And what you see here, this is a continuum spectrum, and you can see how it's sort of dying off on the sides here. That relative intensity of the colors that you're seeing up there is how easy it is for your eyes to pick up these different wavelengths of light. 
So when you start to get down into here, you're in the infrared. When you're over here, you're in the UV. You can't see those. Your eyes are not sensitive enough in that region. A continuum spectra is from anything that is glowing hot enough to be emitting white light. So the old-fashioned tungsten light bulbs that you can no longer get because they've been replaced with the compact fluorescent ones, that is considered to be a continuous light spectrum. If you were to use a spectroscope to look at that, you would see a spectra like this. It's called a continuum, right? Continuous spectra. There are two sides to the coin when you're talking about spectra. One of the sides of that is emission lines, and the other side of that is absorption lines. So how do you get emission versus absorption lines? As you can see here, if you're looking at the black body radiator, which we don't actually have anything that really represents a black body radiator to a high degree of precision. Unfortunately, they just don't exist. We live in the real world and not physics land. Physics land is next door to Never Never Land. Peter Pan drops by for tea uh, every day at 3. The Lost Boys are wonderful, a little rowdy, but you know, Physics land, all of these hypothetical situations that we like to go ahead and give ourselves, they don't really exist. So if you were to look at a star, you would see it as a continuous spectrum, as long as there is nothing between you and that star. If there is something between you and that star, a cloud of gas, for example, in the sun you have the chromosphere, which is a cloud of gas between the photosphere and you, you get certain lines that are taken out of the spectrum, and that's an absorption feature. If, however, you are looking at the cloud of gas without the black body behind it, you will see those same lines, except you'll see them as bright against a dark background rather than as being absorbed out of the continuum. Okay, so it's just a matter of the geometry of the situation. Um, interestingly enough, here on Earth, we use this emission spectrum to our advantage with things like uh, the overhead lights that you're viewing, sodium lamps, neon lamps for example, okay? So um, spectra are produced in a couple of different ways. The biggest way that we're going to focus in on today is what's called photoionization, which is, let's take the sun as an example because it is, as Stephen said, this glorious floating science lab in the sky. You've got photons coming off of the photosphere of the sun. They're interacting with various particles that are in the chromosphere. And what is happening is electrons are being excited as these photons are hitting it. So what we're looking at when we're looking at the hydrogen lines, the Balmer lines, these are the ones that people are really familiar with, is you have hydrogen atoms in the upper layer of the sun's atmosphere. You've got this N2 orbital shell that the electron is in because it's a high temperature, it's already got some excitement occurring. And then as the photons stream out, they hit this electron and interact with it and give it that specific amount of energy to move to the n equal 3 orbital, quantum mechanics, right? Something either exists in this state or this state. So what you've got is you've got this very specific wavelength of light that is taken out. That's your absorption feature. Now, as it drops back down from the n3 to n2 orbital, it will re-emit that same wavelength of light, that exact same photon energy is re-emitted. Now, the interesting thing when you're looking at the sun is it doesn't matter if that photon was originally headed to you, it's probably going to get ejected way out this way instead of right back towards you. There's some scatter involved with that. It's a statistical thing. So basically, there is a very slight re-emission line. Those hydrogen alpha telescopes that you're looking through is looking at that very, very, very fine re-emission line. 0.7 angstroms, as a matter of fact. The width of the line, the absorption feature, several angstroms. And let me go ahead and clarify real fast. Angstroms and nanometers. I'm going to go back and forth between the two. Uh, unfortunately, physicists really like nanometers. Astronomers really like angstroms. So some of the slides are going to be angstroms. Some are going to be nanometers. An angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. So it's just an order of magnitude. Add or subtract a zero. All right. And I'll try and catch myself on that. So you've got absorption and emission lines that are coming out in this fashion. The other way that you can manage to have emission lines, and this is what we use to make uh, light here on Earth, is you can excite these electrons by applying a voltage to them, because as it turns out, when you're th looking at things physics-wise, astronomy-wise, temperature is actually just a measure of the speed of particles, okay? So if you heat up these particles, they're moving around, they're interacting with each other, they bump into one another, and that excites the electrons into the higher energy orbital. And then as it drops to that lower energy orbital, it emits light. 
Well, heck, that's how you get neon lamps outside. Open for business. All right, all you're doing is applying a very high voltage, heating this gas up as those electrons lose that energy, it emits light, and we can see by it. All right, so we make use of this. This is practical, everyday applications. And that's sort of what I'm going to be t showing you is some of the, how we know the stuff we know, what we use spectroscopy for. So spectra are produced. You have a light source. You pass it through a very thin slit, and then you pass it through either a prism or a diffraction grating. Prisms have sort of fallen out because you do have so much more dispersion across the different wavelengths with a prism. A diffraction grating is much more linear, and that's what most of your modern spectrographs are going to be made with. You then pass that through some sort of collimator, it brings it to a focus, and you get a very nice spectra, all right, on a screen or a detector. For most of your astronomy applications now, you're using some sort of CCD detector with a very high quantum efficiency in order to be able to have the most information coming out of that spectra that you're looking at. It used to be that you had a spectrograph that took up, this is the uh, Kitt Peak 2.1 meter telescope with the Coude spectrograph. I have been in this room. It is about mm, two stories down in order to have the equipment necessary to actually observe these spectra and make detailed observations about it. All right, room on the back of a 2.1 meter telescope. Now you can buy things that will allow you to study spectra and hook it up to the back of your own personal telescope and make very similar observations to this. This is the Alpi 600, which is a product that's being put out by Shellyac that I have had a chance to work with. It's a wonderful little piece of equipment. And it's amazing that you can do some of the same things with this in your backyard as you used to have to be able to go out to these big telescopes. Now, obviously, there are some benefits to the big telescopes, but it still stands that this is very cool stuff that is now very much in reach of the average everyday person who's just sitting there like, ooh, gee, I really wonder what's going on, all right? What can be done with spectra? Well, based on the fact that all of these unique barcode identifiers are associated with these different elements, with these different chemicals, with these different compounds, we can actually go in and determine the composition of the universe, right? So this is how we know that the universe is predominantly made up of hydrogen. It's got a little bit of helium and then trace amounts of everything else. All of the lines, if you guys go out and see the spectroscopes outside, all of those lines cutting across the spectrum, all of those absorption features, uh, correspond to every naturally occurring element that exists. In the sun alone, all right, we've been able to quantify everything from hydrogen up to uranium, any naturally occurring element. And we can tell all sorts of other things about the compositions of other stars, H2 regions, emission nebulas, uh, planetary nebulas, galaxies, this is all from just looking at those absorption features. The radio velocity is probably the single biggest thing scientifically that, we'll, that we can do. Um, abundances, temperatures, pressures, these sorts of things are done by looking at those line ratios. And we'll get into that. So wh what is a black body? A hypothetical black body curve looks like this, all right? So this is what the sun's black body curve looks like. You can see that the sun is not an actual black body radiator you've got some differences between what the black body is supposed to look like and what it actually looks like, but it's the best thing that we've got, right? Um, and this yellow line right here is the absorption features at the top of the atmosphere. So that's what the sun looks like when it hits the top of our atmosphere. This is what it looks like down at the bottom of the atmosphere. So yay for being able to breathe, boo for astronomy, try, you know, astronomers trying to go out and actually get light in various different wavelengths, right? You can see these H2O lines down in the infrared. Everybody's all upset about you know, carbon dioxide being a greenhouse gas. What they don't tell you, water vapor is pretty nasty too. As we heat up, we get more water vapor in the atmosphere as well. You're going to jack up the temperature. You're going to have methane start to get released. That's really nasty. So, you know, there are some practical applications in even looking at climate science as well, because we can study the relative abundances of H2O in the atmosphere by how much is being bled out of the solar spectrum. But that black body curve is important because this equation right here will actually give us an effective temperature of stars. So you may have looked at photos of stars that have been taken, beautiful deep fields of open clusters, and you notice some are red, some are blue, some are white. 
It turns out that just looking at the color of the star tells us about something of the effective temperature of the star. So if you have a star like an O star or a B star that's got, you know, 10,000 Kelvin, it peaks over here in the, infra in the ultraviolet and you get more blue light coming off of that star. If you've got something like an M-class dwarf that's peaking down over more towards the red end of the spectrum, it's going to shift that star's profile red. All right? So we can make determinations. If we can measure the black body curve, we can determine the effective temperature of the surface of that star. All right? Incidentally, people really, really, really emit well in the infrared, which is why when you go out and you see these new fancy things that the United States military is working on for night vision goggles, it's all thermal because humans are great black body radiators in the infrared and you light up like a Christmas tree on one of those infrared screens. So we're able to determine the spectral types of stars which gives us something about the mass and temperature of a star. Any star that's on the main sequence we can make a determination about the spectral type of the star by looking at the different lines. So here we've got a B-class star. You can see these very well-defined lines in here. These are associated with hydrogen, all right? Because these stars are so hot, everything else in those stars is ionized in the visible wavelength ranges, you're not going to see any other lines. However, as you come down to these cooler stars, you're actually able to see very many more lines down here. There are molecular lines in these cool stars, titanium oxide. That tells us something about the relative temperatures. Because if the temperature gets too hot and it starts stripping those electrons out and it starts stripping those molecule, the, the atoms of those molecules apart, it'll show up in the spectra. And a really nifty thing about this, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the idea of interstellar reddening, but if we look at a star and we can see that it's got a spectral profile of a B-type star, but for whatever reason, due to the dust and gas in our galaxy, we're losing a lot of the blue end of the spectrum in the power curve that we're looking at, we can actually say, oh, there's got to be this much dust and gas in between us and this star in this region of space. And we can look at that and we can say, well, we need to apply a correction. And that gives us better understanding about things like the expansion of the universe for galaxies along that same line of sight. There was an American team that very recently had to do this with a paper. Um, if you guys have been following the news, uh, they ran into a problem with that. So this is something that we're able to actually continually self-correct the science that's currently ongoing. I've got this labeled as helium, nobilium, and oxygen-3. Uh, a lot of people tend to know that helium was something that was discovered in the sun. When they were looking at the sun, when they first understood what these absorption features were telling us, they found that there were these absorption features in the sun that had never been seen on Earth that they couldn't explain. And they were looking at it and they were like, mm, new element, we're going to name it helium. Greek word for sun is helos, made sense, right? So, a little bit while longer, this has really started sort of an arms race to find these new elements, to find these new objects that could have this different element, get your name in the periodic table of elements, be famous for all eternity, right? So, somebody was viewing the Cat's Eye Nebula, and they saw this really weird line down in the green end of the spectrum. They couldn't figure out what it was. It wasn't anything on the periodic table of elements that actually was able to correspond spectral-wise with what they were seeing. So, they're like, great, new element, nobilium. Let's go ahead and coin this term. So for a long time, they couldn't figure out where it went on the periodic table of elements. Chemists kept getting better and better results for the existing elements, and it got to the point where they were like, mm, this doesn't fit anymore. So some very clever people got to the point where they understood that this actually was what is called a forbidden transition of oxygen, a doubly ionized oxygen atom, that because of the relative lack of stuff in space, actually tells us something about the pressure and the temperature in planetary nebula and H2 regions. So a lot of people will throw an O3 filter on the end of their camera and take a deep space image of a nebula and not necessarily realize what the, why they're doing it. The reason why they're doing it is because this is representing a vacuum here on Earth. You hook your Black & Decker up to a bell jar and you start pulling the air out of that and even the best vacuum that we can get under lab conditions, you've still got about a billion particles per cubic meter. So not a real great vacuum. However, in the vacuum of space, even out in the interstellar media where you've got these more dense regions, you've got a, about, you know, three, four particles per cubic meter. So what ends up happening with the O3 is that normally 
under conditions found here on Earth, these electrons would bump into other particles that are present, and you would end up having this de-excitation collisionally. So just like when you turn on a neon lamp, you can excite the electrons, you also get de-excitation by collisions. But in the vacuum of space, there's not enough particles for this to happen. So we've never seen this here on Earth. So when you throw an O3 filter on the end of your telescope, you're seeing something that could never physically happen here on Earth just due to the density of particles within our atmosphere. All right? And what you're able to do is actually see what these oxygen molecules are doing, way out, or these oxygen um, atoms are doing way out in deep space. All right? And this is all the different filters. All of the different filters that you're dealing with, there's reasons for those specific filters. Anyone in here ever had a speeding ticket? Then you're familiar with the Doppler effect. For those of you who have not had a speeding ticket, the Doppler effect, as illustrated here, so you're standing here, or you're sitting in traffic, and some guy on a street bike comes up, and he's flying past you, and you get that nice sound effect as he's coming towards you. Because if you're on that bike, you hear the same sound over and over and over again, that engine turning over. But if you're in front of that bike, as he's moving towards you, those waves are building up on each other. They're shrinking down the wavelengths. And then as he passes you and moves away, those wavelengths stretch out, right? So here on Earth, with sound waves, you've got this equation here. This, the velocity of the wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength, right? It governs the wave speed. And there are some variables involved in that. However, C is the speed of light. And C is set, 3 times 10 to the 8th, approximately, meters per second, all right? So if we use this equation, we can actually turn around and make a determination about how fast an object is moving. You've got to realize that relativistically, speeds start to act differently than when you're dealing with very slow-moving objects here on Earth. So what you end up with is this thing called a red or blue shift due to the Doppler effect. And this is how we make radial velocity measurements. Radial velocity measurements are basically, like I said before, the science behind all of this, right? Because you can see this. This is uh, taken from my master's thesis. You've got this feature over the course of just one night, just one night, that's actually drifting across this silicon three line down in the blue end of the spectrum, all right? That's a radial velocity shift that we're actually able to measure and then make a determination about how fast that star is moving. This feature is actually, this is Spica, and what we're seeing here is Spica has a secondary companion that's moving around it that induces a wobble in the, st in the, plant, in the star system, but then you also have the outer layer of this star that's pulsating. So you're seeing not only the secondary companion go around it, but you're seeing the star breathe it's called helioseismology, and it's due to the fact that you've got this tidal force that's being induced by the secondary companion. And that's all radial velocity shift. That's all that is. Okay. Doppler shift is actually responsible for how we have approximate idea where MH370 went down. So the signal coming off of the airplane, they were actually able to go back in and deduce where this plane was from some of the satellite information that they had, and then by looking at that signal and how it was changing, whether it was moving away from the satellite or towards the satellite. So that's how they knew that they needed to be looking in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Australia. That is mind-boggling. That was the first time that this particular principle has been used in a search and rescue operation. And, um, you know, we have very high certainty that we are in the correct area, it's just a matter of, it's a big swath of the ocean to cover even still. And yes, like I said, it is involved in speeding tickets, all right? The cop has a radar or laser gun of a known frequency, it hits you, bounces back, they measure the offset, and they get how fast you were moving. Which means it does not matter how fast you stomp on the brakes, you are not braking at the speed of light. You might as well just keep going, all right? They've got you if they want you. A little bit more of the bigger picture, um, expansion of the universe, right? We know the universe is expanding. How do we know this? Um, this picture is very good illustration um, for all practical purposes. If you want to think about it as a balloon, you can think about it as a balloon. It's not really like a balloon, but hey, it works, okay? But not really. So 
if you think about all the galaxies as being on the outside of a balloon that you're inflating and they're all rushing away from each other, that's sort of what's happening within the universe. If we look at galaxies beyond just our local cluster, they're all redshifted. They're all moving away from us. And yes, I should go ahead and say a blue shift is something moving toward us. A red shift is something moving away. So all galaxies outside of our local cluster are moving away from us. And the further out you go, the faster they're moving away. So we know that the universe is expanding, and it's expanding at an accelerating rate. Well, how do we know that? Type 1a supernova, right? Um, you can see in this infographic up here, very good infographic, type 1a supernova is when you have a white dwarf. It accretes matter onto it. And then it eventually reaches what's called the chandra sekar limit. 1.4 solar masses. When it hits that, the white dwarf can no longer support the mass. It explodes into a supernova. And it has a very unique spectral profile associated with it, which you can see up here. So when a supernova goes off, you have to look at it spectroscopically in order to determine what type of supernova it is. If it's a type 1a supernova, then it's what we call a standard candle. It has a well-known absolute magnitude. And from that, we can use the distance modulus to figure out how far away this thing is from us. And we can also measure the redshift. All right. Very, very good. You can see there are differences between the type 1a, the type 2, type 1c, and type 1b supernova. The only way to be able to tell these differences is by looking at the spectra. As I said earlier, binary motion. This is um, a work where you can actually see a little bit better. This M2 right here, this is the secondary mass, uh, or the secondary star in this. So you have this absorption feature right here that's associated with the primary star, and then you have this radial velocity shift as this other star is pulling on the system. So yeah, what we can get from this is we can get that we've got a binary system because we're seeing this very peculiar motion, but from the speed at which this is moving, you can also determine how fast the stars are revolving around each other. From that, you can apply some equations to that and get a mass limit. And then, assuming that you've got a transiting binary system, you can actually get a very good mass limit. So this is how we know how massive things have got to be, um, how massive the light in emitting material in the universe is. You get a very good understanding of the mass of these stars. You correlate that to the spectral type. You correlate that to the temperature. This is how we have that nice HR diagram that we always refer to um, with that main sequence star lying within like the main sequence, for example. And this is actually how we know about exosolar planets. So a binary star system, you've got hundreds of kilometers per second that you're able to measure. In order to measure exosolar planets, of course, you have to get down to meters per second. So this is something that big telescopes, big spectrographs in order to be able to do this. But it, this is how we know how big these exosolar planets are, where these exosolar planets are located, is radial velocity studies of the host star of these systems. Variable star studies is a big thing that occur with spectroscopy. So people are familiar with, um, you know, p signing profile, for example, as you have uh, a system that has got some sort of high velocity expulsion of gas from the central star, you're going to have material that's moving towards you and material that's moving away from you that is actually outside of the star's light coming towards you. And you get this really, really cool p signing profile, which you can see here. And in an observation two weeks later, it's actually gone. So um, people ask, you know, okay, I'm interested in getting started in spectroscopy. Is there actually a way for me to have meaningful input on this? Yes, there is. Um, amateur spectroscopists actually have a tremendous uh, advantage over professional astronomers in that you don't have to fight for time on a telescope. All right. If a professional astronomer wants to use a telescope, they have to put in a grant that's competing with 300 other grants, and then they have to get that approved, and they have to have the money, and then they have to go out, and if it's clouded over, oh well. So, yeah, out of luck. However, for an amateur with a telescope in their backyard, a spectroscope hooked up to it, you can look at something for weeks, months at a time, get lots of data, and then we can actually look at how the period variability is affected by certain things on these star systems. I actually have a colleague who's working with a bunch of people across the globe to have a, a spectroscope across the globe 
type deal going where they were looking at a Wolf Riot star and managed to get about two weeks of continual data on this Wolf Riot star corresponding to satellite imagery that they were able to take. So it would not have been possible without amateur spectroscopists. All right? This is uh, showing another example of, um, this is a double peak in the H alpha. So this line right here is H alpha. You can see this slight shift in the peak. That's from the Doppler shift of a circumstellar disk of material around a BE star as one side is coming towards you and the other side is moving away from you. You can get rotation rates, all right? So this is looking at the sun in particular. And um, what you see here is these two lines that are lined up Top and bottom, those are oxygen lines from the Earth's atmosphere. Those lines are called telluric lines. We have a very good bead on what those are, so we can remove them. But occasionally, they're handy for calibration purposes. This is looking at the east side of the sun. West side of the sun, you can notice that there's a very big difference between those. That offset is very vividly showing that Doppler effect that you're getting as you've got these two troughs that are very widely offset. But you still are looking at the same portion of the spectrum because those O2 lines add up nicely. You have things like the Zeeman effect, which end up giving you, in the presence of a strong magnetic field, spectral lines will split. So this is how we know proof positive, proof positive, that the sunspots on the sun have a magnetic field associated with them. All right? The magnetic field that did this line broadening that you're seeing right here is about a 2,500 Gauss magnetic field. The sun's normal magnetic field is only about one gauss. The Earth's magnetic field is about a half a gauss. Uh, put this in perspective a little bit. Neodymium magnets right now are about 13,000 gauss. So it's a strong magnetic field for the sun, not necessarily a super strong magnetic field. But information, valuable information, is being derived from these sorts of things. All right? And you can see very nicely right here this split line. Um, when you're looking at it, with a CCD detector, sometimes all it does is broaden the line out rather than actually split it out because the resolutions are not necessarily always the greatest. And then um, just sort of to cap this off and finish it off, uh, this is something that I've pulled directly from Sheliak's website because I find it so uh, fascinating. Um, this is the entire visible spectrum of light taken through one of their instruments with several of the more prominent lines highlighted. Iron, magnesium, hydrogen, helium, sodium, all right? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lines. The sun is just, it's amazing. And it's our nearest star, so we tend to like to look at it and just sort of, yeah, forget about it, that it's actually a star. You would not believe the number of times I've gotten into an argument that, you know, yes, it's a star. It is a star. I promise you it's a star. It's just the closest star to us, all right? But um, a wonderful infographic just showing all of that off. Um, and that is really going to go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate being here today. Thank you so much.